But a couple months before that, I told my mom that I wanted to be called Felix. And she responded, so does that make you a boy now? And I responded with no. And she goes, does that mean you're a girl? And I said, no. And I don't blame her for asking this. She, like most people, think that gender, like most things, exists on a binary system, the gender binary. Like when you meet someone for the first time and you ask them, so are you a cat person or a dog person? This doesn't take into mind that there is a whole spectrum of opportunity. You can like both at the same time. You can prefer not to have pets, or you can like fish or birds. And your pet preference doesn't mean a lot about your gender, but we can understand the analogy, that there is this whole spectrum of opportunity besides what we see as a binary system, this man and woman. And with this supposed binary comes the roles that are enforced with it, gender roles. And we can see that from a very young age, children are expected to act a certain way based on their body type, their genitalia, their chromosomes, their gonads, all sorts of bodily expect all sorts of expectations are placed on them based on their bodies. But as we delve deeper, we can understand that there are syndromes that cause chromosomes not to be the standard XX or XY, like Turner's syndrome, for example, just causes a basic X chromosome. So we can look at it, we can see that the lines that define sex are actually pretty blurred. And there's a, um, a variety of different conditions that also cause intersex people. So if we look at this and we see that there isn't actually just a basis of man and woman, we can, under, we can start to break down these gender roles, which is something that feminists have been trying to do for a very long time, break down the supposed gender roles. And we have seen that with the fact that women have started to shave less and this idea of pushing towards that women shouldn't be forced to shave. And, but as we move on, we still force trans women to be in these gender roles. And we have to examine why that we do this, that doctors will actually refuse hormones to their trans patients if they don't act a certain way that conforms to femininity. And it's the same thing with trans men, this idea that trans men and trans women have to be forced within this gender binary, even though that some of them exist outside of it, like me. I consider myself to be non-binary, which means that I don't, idea, I don't agree with the idea of what it means to be a girl or what it means to be a man. I don't really see myself falling on the spectrum. I don't like to adhere to the typical gender roles that are assigned to me, and I don't want people's per perception of me being based on gender. And because of this, like other non-binary people, I prefer the pronouns they, them. And you might be thinking to yourself, that's not grammatically correct. But you're wrong. It is. We use the singular they on a near daily basis without even realizing it. When you talk about someone without assuming their gender, you use the singular they. If you're talking to your parent and you say to them, and they did just there without even realizing it, did the mailman bring the letter of mail? I don't know if they did. It's because you're not assuming the gender. But gender has become so ingrained into our, our society that we look at a person and we automatically assume how they identify by the way that they express ourselves. But we can realize that not everyone has the means to express themselves the way that they want to. That has, not everyone has the opportunities that I have had to stand up here and to explain gender to a group of people listening, to be able to come out to their parents with little to no backlash. Not everyone has this opportunity. So it's up to us to decouple this idea of gender and clothing, hair, voice. But we can't talk about decoupling gender without talking about how this forced gender harms women or more specifically trans women. If we look at the media and we see this trope of a woman in a, of a man in a dress and we see that, you know, long hair in a dress, beautiful, but as soon as they talk, they have a deep voice and we say, that's an outsider, this isn't what it means to be a woman. Then we start to separate, like we have cisgender people and the other and they're bad, they're not normal. So because we enforce this stereotypical, what it means to be a man, what it means to be a woman, this idea of gender, we are harming the people, we are harming people that just want to express themselves. And in the course of this TED Talks, I've talked to many different trans people about what it means for them to be transgender, what it means for them to exist as designated female at birth, designated male at birth, and throughout their transition. And one person that really stood out to me was named Vivian. And they are 21 years old, and like me, they prefer they, them pronouns. And when we talked about using they, them pronouns, they told me that they've been accused of single-handedly destroying the English language by using these pronouns, which is, you know, 
pretty exaggerated, non-obvious claim, but the fact that people are more willing to uphold archaic grammar traditions than to respect a person's identity is pretty ridiculous. We are more willing to uphold these archaic traditions than we are to respect people. And just let that sink in. The fact that I am working endlessly to get my name changed that costs hundreds of dollars, that, co that is so much paperwork, is ridiculous. And the fact is, that's not the only piece of paper that you have to get changed. For many trans people, they can go through the transition process but still not have proper identification with their proper gender. So trans women will go to bars, hand in their ID, and when it says male on him, that can lead to physical assault, that can lead to denial of employment and denial of housing. And with this, we can understand why one in five transgender people have experienced homelessness, according to the National Transgender Discrimination Survey. One in five, that's an astounding number. That is almost ridiculous to believe. But if we look at the way society treats trans people, people that aren't conforming to gender, we can understand why. Why there is this huge stigma attached to being outside your gender. And I am lucky. There is no unified transgender experience. My experience is completely different from someone who is a trans woman of color living in a more southern, conservative state. I am lucky. But there are people that aren't as lucky. And it's up to us to amplify their voices, allow them to be heard. A wise man once told me that power is death. But we are the power. We aren't as deaf, and it's up to us to use our voices to amplify those who don't get a chance to speak due to their race, due to their sexual orientation, and due to their gender identity. And I want to amplify those voices. And I used Instagram as a means to come out because I knew social media was a way to get my voice heard, I knew it was the widest way to talk to as many people as I needed to. And we are a generation that is addicted to our phones, addicted to social media, and we have this stereotype placed upon us that we are addicted to our computers, that we never communicate with anyone. Why not use that for a good cause? There is currently a bill in the Senate from Tennessee that restricts trans women to use men's bathrooms based on the gender that they were assigned at birth, an arbitrary thing that is just based on genitalia, which might not even look stereotypically man. So why are we restricting people? Why are we forcing people to be uncomfortable? The University of Vermont was actually the first university to allow students to talk about their, or to have their preferred pronouns on their application. And when I talked to Vivian, they mentioned to me that one of the worst things was constant misgendering, this constant use of gendered language when it was completely unnecessary. So I'm asking you to think about the idea of just removing this immediate conception of gender. When you see someone, don't automatically assume how they might feel about themselves because expression and identity aren't inherently linked because some people don't have the means, some people don't have the resources, or they just physically can't. So your identity isn't exactly linked with your body. You can express yourself however you want. So if I look at a person, I'm not going to automatically assume their gender because of how they look because that idea is inherently transphobic and rooted in this binary system that we have upheld for years. Even though the idea of being like genderless has dated back thousands and thousands of years, this gender binary is in a completely Western, a Western idea that we have upheld. So if we remove this idea of what it means to be a man, what it means to be a woman, we can make safer spaces for people that just want respect. I talked to many different trans people, and in the end, what they wanted was respect. They weren't asking for handouts or special treatment, just the correct pronouns, the correct name, maybe a gender-neutral bathroom or two, just so they could feel comfortable in the society that they live in. Trans women of color face one of the highest murder rates in the country. How many bodies we have to get through before we start realizing that they are people that need the same respect and treatment that we do. So I implore you to use your voice for a good cause to go home and start speaking out against discrimination, to start, to start speaking out against those who are being killed for expressing themselves in every way they can. And I'm incredibly thankful that I do have this platform, that I'm able to speak out and talk, again, talk about something that is very important to me because of who I am. I identify as non-binary, and you might think that that's a pretty new concept but it isn't. There's sort of a gender object impermanence. Just because you haven't heard of it 
doesn't mean it hasn't existed for a long time. But I, the, actually, the first transgender like pride flag was created in 2014, but the existence of gender neutral pronouns has dated back to 1970. And I'm very thankful that I can stand up here and talk to you about this. But I can't be alone. My voice it, is pretty quiet when it's by itself. And the people that are in the position of power, the cisgender, heterosexual, white people, they do have this power. They are heard. And power isn't a death if everyone is screaming. And I think, and when I look out, I see the people that have been calling me Felix, been using the right pronouns. So I thank you for giving me this opportunity and any future action that you do take to end transphobia and for calling me Felix, even if that's the name that isn't on my ID. Thank you.